So the talk is actually called Rapidly Iterating DSP, basically how I got from there to here. Um, so this is the architecture I came up with where uh, there's some spectrum sensing up front connected to a USERP and um, then, uh, then channelize and go into a TensorFlow neural network that's been trained to do the classification. Um, here are some internal guts. Uh, so the problem is uh, you're using, or I'm using GNU Radio to do all of the spectrum sensing. Um, TensorFlow exists basically in Python, um, or at least most people use it from Python. So you have to figure out how to get samples that you've already processed uh, into some usable format for Python. If you want to do your DSP in GNU Radio, because it's nice for that. Um, so you have this queue in between, and you're shipping over a lot of samples over some network socket uh, just to get into Python. Um, so this has multiple problems. Um, I'll discuss them shortly. But uh, one of them is that uh, here's some performance curves for uh, basically a radiometer or channelized radiometer, uh, which is doing the detection. And then um, the actual classification. You can see that if a uh, signal is there, then you can actually, at least with, in this case, you can do a better job classifying than you can detecting signals, um, which is kind of bizarre. So if we just add it in, I mean, it's not entirely fair because the radiometer radio knows nothing about the signal structure. If you added in noise as a class, um, you'd probably do better. Uh, but anyway, um, this brings up this sort of development problem of uh, we're working on this sort of iterative algorithm to do basically improve our uh, sensing ability. Came up with uh, this sort of tool where um, I can go through and play files with uh, signals in them and then go through the timer. I think this is the vector sync or the time raster plot. Um, that I sort of abused to give me a, um, basically a mask of when I detected signals over time. And then uh, you also have like your FFT or PSD type thing with um, uh, the threshold plotted along with it and then draw some green bars to say like we found, here's where we think the edges are. Um, so as I was developing this uh, and I was working on this with my coworker Kellen, uh, we came up with this sort of uh, GUI where you can twiddle a bunch of knobs and um, basically you, as you keep going, um, you run into sort of realistic problems where uh, it's actually, if you take out the assumptions where you know the channel bounds, then it's actually kind of hard to get like the actual signal bandwidth. Um, yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, I mean, I can't see it. Last time I tried to mess with uh, the monitor, my computer crashed, so I'm just gonna leave it like it is. Um, is it really that bad? Uh, no, I, I mean, I can't see, so I can't use the mouse and, right. I have no feedback, except for you guys. <laughs> Unless someone wants to like tell me left or right, then I'm not gonna do anything. <laughs> Like a present in Google Slides? Where is it? You present. Ah, look at that. Control. Someone is right. Or close. All right. Sweet. Um, yeah, so um, when you're actually doing this development, it's incredibly frustrating because. Um, you have an idea to uh, basically take into account something else uh, that's, part of the sig that's part of the signals that you're seeing. Um, and so you want to go in and add a parameter to your algorithm. Um, so you go into your C++ code, you add in a parameter. Uh, if you want to be able to move that while you're, or change that parameter while you're actually playing back the file, 
then you have to expose it through GRC and through some XML or YAML soon. Um, then add in a GUI element, place it in the right place, and then uh, fiddle around. So it's, it's actually kind of a, Unit Radio is great for some things. Um, this is probably one of the things that, uh, I don't know if it was actually on the development roadmap or not, but having like a property tree where you just one place list this as a parameter would be a great thing. Um, so anyway, I took this experience and um, basically decided that I had many problems. Um, I forget what I listed here, but there were several. Um, one of them is just the rapid, rapidly iterating um, is actually kind of a long cycle to get from here's an idea for a new parameter or changing the parameter, uh, going into the code, adding it in all the right ways, and then actually fiddling with it. Um, the other is that if there is a, so these files that I'm working with usually have multiple signals at different times. Um, if you want to focus in on one thing, then you either have to create a new file or um, um, come up with some weird like seeking mechanism while your radio is running. Um, let's see, what else did I put here? Um, yeah, so we can go to the next slide. And um, my solution was basically just to do everything in Python. Um, some people will use MATLAB or Octave. Uh, that's great, but um, Python has become really popular and it mates well with TensorFlow, so that's what I went with. Um, so this is kind of insane because I just swapped out some other problems for some new problems. Um, among those, Python 2 and 3, uh, and we've heard about 6 already. So like, supporting the Python API is kind of a pain. Um, the global interpreter lock is a huge problem. It means that you pretty much have horrible multiprocessing. Um, you just can't really do it. Uh, yeah, and then no types. like. Types are a great thing, uh, and we just don't have them in Python. It's also really slow. It's got a. It's notorious for being slow. Um, I was reading Hacker News one day, and there was this article from IBM discussing how to make Python as fast as Julia. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Julia, but it's another sort of scientific programming language. Um, on the far left there is just a screenshot from this article, where uh, they used Cython to. Uh, I guess just in time compile some Fibonacci sequence calculation. Uh, and then here's some snapshots from uh, the comments section. Yeah, I went to the comments section. Um, so there's some people debating on, uh, like no one can even agree how you increase the performance of Python. So like some people say, here's a great book. Someone else says, oh, we can do even better. And then another person says, well, actually Julia is just as good. So like. Why are you even doing this in the first place? Um, so there's, and then some people say like loss is really good. So um, everyone's sort of biased by their own opinions. Um, I like Volk. I think it's pretty fast, and uh, I like developing with it. So that's the direction that I went. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, I'll get to it in a um, quick second. So. Uh, the problem now is I want to use Volk to improve or to make my Python code faster so I can actually do DSP in Python. There's a half dozen ways that I can easily count of getting C++ or C code to run in Python. Um, how do you choose one? Uh, well, these are all, these all have their own trade-offs, right? So um, I have examples from different uh, attempts to wrap C code or C++ code here. Um, I think they all wind up looking kind of weird. Um, like, boost, like Swig is bad because it doesn't support NumPy. So if you try to do anything with an array or a NumPy array, then you wind up doing a double to float conversions all the time if you're not careful. And that's really bad. Um, there's a SIP, which is basically the QT project saw that they had they wanted to support Python bindings. Um, they didn't like any of the options that were available, so they made their own, and that's how we got SIP. Um, there's like just-in-time compilers, so uh, Cython and um, C types, or I guess, uh, yeah, Pyrex. That's just actually what NumPy uses. Um, and there's Boost Python. 
which uh, has become sort of popular in our community apparently. Um, I don't like it because it sort of, again, looks like a third language that just happens to be compilable with the C++ compiler, uh, but it looks really weird. So my solution was just to use the C API in Python and NumPy. Uh, it winds up looking kind of like this. So um, one thing I kind of like about the NumPy documentation is that they have two quotes from famous people on all of their pages. Uh, sometimes they're inspirational. Sometimes you get things like this. Um, and I don't claim that I have first-rate intelligence because I started pretty close to a solution and then wound up going backwards and writing C code against Python, uh, which is maybe insane, but it seems to work. So you just do some um, basic type checking, uh, do some sanitizing on your input, and then get out a buffer and make your call. So I call some Volk function down here. Um, so now here's some benchmarks. So um, the top two are interesting because I just stole them from the Hacker News comments section. Um, so here is uh, basically uh, NumPy being, or adding x plus two, or x plus two times y. Um, so if you do that, uh, here's sort of native Python, um, then the NumPy add function, and then PV is actually PyVolk, so those are the wrappers that I've made. Um, they'll be available on GitHub later this weekend, or later this week. Um, so you can see it actually is faster. Uh, if you try to go back and compare against Julia, uh, mixed bag, um, not as good it looks like, at least on my machine. Maybe I did something wrong, I don't know. Um, then this is an actual useful example because this is sort of where I started, um, again, with the radiometer, just the simplest thing possible. Uh, and the reason I actually started on the Python wrappers was because I, I obviously it has a reputation for being slow, but when I actually built the radiometer in Python, it took way too long on the files that I was working on. Um, and sure enough, it was a 10 times speed up by um, just writing some pretty short C code that or enabled me to call C from Python. So that was a huge win. Um, let's see, so now the problem is, how do I get samples? Um, working from files is great, but I really want to get samples from hardware. Um, I could have gone SOAP SDR route, I guess, but uh, maybe I suffer from non invented to hear syndrome. So uh, I wrote wrappers around UHD. UHD now has Python support. Um, I don't know what to say about that other than they took a really long time releasing it. Uh, so here's another version. Um, I happen to like mine because it feels a little bit more Pythonic than theirs. Um, you should probably use theirs because they'll actually support you. Uh, <laughs> mine's available on GitHub. If it doesn't work, I will. Um, yeah, so uh, this is what it winds up actually looking like. So you just have, uh, you just create a usurp object where you tell it what type you want. So it does the whole like searching, for, you can give it an address if you wanted. Um, I sort of removed the concept of the sub dev from the AP, like API. So this is why I feel like it's a little bit more Pythonic maybe because sub devs really confuse me. I have no idea what they are. Um, I've tried to ask some people and no one can explain it. Um, so they're gone, you just say AA, you don't have to worry about what it, the abstraction of subdev is. Um, let's see. Yeah, so now I have uh, samples off of radio. I have some fast DSP. Um, I can call matplotlib and do visualizations, but uh, it's now limiting that I can't watch streaming visualizations. So uh, one day I was just sitting around um, trying to think through how to do this, and then uh, GSOC started, and someone started talking about Boca GUI. So I looked at Boca and saw that it actually solves this problem. So I'm not using GR Boca GUI, uh, but this is sort of a project that I made with Mark Lichtwin. This is mostly Mark, uh, this visualization stuff. Um, I think we can do a demo here, maybe. Although uh, I'm not having great computer luck right now, so we'll see. All right, 
So I'm just going to run uh, user demo. So we just call a usurp demo here and should, oh boy, I didn't like that. Um, no, this isn't working. Ah, yeah, okay, loading the FPGA. So you just get this layout here where um, we're gonna get a frequency, sort of a FFT plot, um, then we have a waterfall in the bottom left, time domain, and then uh, the IQ plot. And you can change the frequency and gains up here. Um, so it just sort of works. And you can view this over a network. Um, earlier today, just, to, just for kicks, I, uh, let's see, control F5. Great. Um, so earlier today, just for kicks, I was twiddling around with the parameters in this uh, demo, and um, this is actually 500 kilohertz. Uh, we're, we're plotting every sample in that waterfall, and it actually kept up. Um, another one of the reasons that I went this route with um, this usurp wrapper is because uh, I had a really hard time in GRUHD streaming uh, at high rates. And so this is pretty much able to keep up with things, um, both the usurp wrapper and the plotter. Um, if you don't plot every sample, then this works pretty well. Um, Mark added in like a, I think you probably saw it on the demo, where there was a utilization wrapper where we have a timer that um, basically counts against the sample rate. And if you're computing faster than the sample rate, then the utilization bar drops down real low. Um, so, Started with Kinder Radio and basically wrapped up every, all these things together. So now you can live in Python. And um, the one thing that's not new is uh, you still have really bad like multiprocessing. So if you need that, that's where you go back into Kinder Radio. Um, and you can either have Lambda blocks or convert everything that you've done in Python into C. And it, if you're using the C wrappers, or if you're using the Python wrappers around Volk, then it's probably uh, pretty straightforward um, translation. Um, so yeah, we've done a uh, fast DSP in Python and we're able to iterate on their um, algorithm development pretty fast. Um, so it's been a cool experience. Everything will be on GitHub. Well, the usurp wrapper is on GitHub uh, if you want it. Um, Volk wrappers will be coming out later this week. Um, so yeah, that's all. Any questions? No questions. One down there. Oh, there we go. So you mentioned one of the challenges, this uh, global interpreter lock as one of the limitation. Have you looked at the, there is, I think, uh, PyPy interpreter has one implementation that doesn't have this GIL limitation. I guess it's, uh, I was doing quick searches like uh, PyPy STM. So have you looked at that or didn't work for you? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, PyPy doesn't have a global interpreter lock, but it also doesn't have a C API. Um, so it, it's, it's um, everything gets just in time compiled. So it's, uh, the syntax is the same as Python, it's the same language, but what actually runs is completely different. Um, so I, I, I don't even know if they have out of the box support for everything in NumPy and Matplotlib. Uh, you almost, I don't think most of those, so I don't know if you can actually run boost Python wrappers in PyPy either. Does anyone know, do you know off the top of your head? I don't know. No? All right. Um, any, anyone else? What, what did you use for PyVolk? Did you also use C-types? Like to wrap? No, th so this is not C-types. Um, this is just the C API. So C-types look like um, that bottom left one there, I think, is that C-types? Or the Fibonacci one is C-types, where uh, you basically say that there's a long in there, and it 
it gets compiled somehow. So, so how did you do PyBulk? Uh, I just wrote the oh, thing okay, against the straight up yeah, yeah. We have a question over there. So with PyVolk, were you creating your own uh, like custom methods that it was calling Volk, or were you like volking out existing NumPy functions? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, again, this is one of the cases where I'm not exactly maintaining the same API. Um, a reason for that is because one of the things that I think people really like, at least I really like about Python, and I think what makes Python popular is that uh, the interfaces are usually fairly simple naming, at least, right? So, um, if, I mean, you've, you're familiar with Volk, so you have the simplest function is probably Volk 32f xt add 32f, right? You could wrap that and have a function name in Python that's that function name. Nothing else in Python looks like that. Um, so I've made things that are, the function name will be like, in this case, um, it will just be pyvolk.multiply. And the parameters that you give it determine what volk function actually gets called. So it is just simple wrappers around volk functions, but in a very Pythonic API. And, and what is, um, this is sort of off topic, but what does NumPy do today? Does it do any, use any SIMD acceleration under the hood, or is it just straight C? NumPy? Um, yeah, that's a good question, too. So um, in the Hacker News comments, someone mentioned blah, like NumPy uses BLOS. So there are optimizations in there. Um, one of the things that I wanted, I thought would have been cool, but um, I had a really hard time following the abstractions, is there's this thing called, uh, num, in NumPy called ufunks. They call them universal functions. Um, that's basically when you call like NumPy add or something. Like that'll be a ufunk. That handles, um, you basically have a kernel, a computation kernel, and uh, you can feed in any size, any shape array, and the ufunk abstracts away handling this shape. It just says that like, you have a one for one input to output shape relationship. So we're just gonna call this kernel on whatever shape this is. Um, that would have been really cool to use. I don't know how practical it is, because there's a lot of, Volk assumes that you have continuous um, buffers. And if you don't have continuous buffers, I don't think you can use um, ufunks. If anyone is able to do that, that'd be really great. But I don't know. So there, is, there are some optimizations in there. Um, it's not like horrible, um, but you can, in fact, do better, and it's not, I mean, it could be that I'm already familiar, very familiar with Volk, and that's why it wasn't so hard. But with well, Larry, with not too much effort, you can drastically speed up things, um, even very simple things. Thank you. So we have time for two more questions. In the meantime, the next presenters can come forward and set up their um, laptop or whatever. I I saw. Oh, there you are. Okay. So any more questions for Nathan? Because we have we have some time, we're not late. There we go. Gentleman with the uh, baseball cap. Here's another demo. Um, I'm sorry if you said this and I didn't catch it, but uh, which uh, when you got those time difference results, which uh, SIMD instruction sets did the Volk kernel support versus maybe NumPy, NumPy supporting or not supporting? Yeah. So in those cases, I think Volk was always using AVX. Um, I don't know what NumPy was using. Um, so it's possible that the NumPy maybe had built in, you know, SSC support and not AVX, and that, that yeah, was yeah. The they could they could just whatever underlying library they're using could be a little bit more out of date. Yeah. Thanks. Does anyone know if NumPy does SSC under the hood? I f I feel like it does, but I. Seem, I feel like if any audience would know that, it would be this one. Probably well, not. The uh, PyCon audience might. I'm sorry? No, no. You don't, you don't know? And there's what? An MKL NumPy? Oh yeah, Intel supports, uh, they have a Intel library for NumPy that uses all the 
all of the Intel MKL things. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nathan. <laughs> You're up next.